Hey everyone, this is Dr. Drizzle and welcome to the National Parks Expedition Challenge. Today we are in Seward, Alaska, adjacent to the Kenan Fjords National Park. Behind me we have our studio audience. Now, I thought they were seagulls, but we're going to find out they have a completely different name and there really is no such thing as seagulls. Who would have thought? But we're so glad to be here. and We're here today with our newest friend, Taze Jones. Like, he, we're related, I think. But <laughs> thank you so much for being here. It is cold here. I know you're probably thinking, no way it feels. It's summer. <laughs> it's summer. great. I love it. It is beautiful here. So thanks for having us. Yeah. And tell us how you came to this particular park. Yeah, I, I get to, I, I actually have a wonderful opportunity because I get to work in lots of parks all around Alaska. And this is just one of many parks that I get to work in. And I ended up here kind of through a really circuitous route where I, I was actually, while I was a student, I started doing work like, like field work. I, I was doing research in national parks and one thing leading to 50, I said, you know, those places seem like really nice places to work. And I ended up just saying, hey, you know, I want to apply and I want to get a job here and see what I can do. And and it, it was a little bit of a hop, skip and a jump in different places here and there. But ultimately, I was able to come up here to Alaska where I came here actually from Hawaii and uh, had spent years working for the Park Service down in Hawaii. But, you know, hey. I will leave the tropics for Alaska because it is an amazing place to be. It absolutely is. We've only been here for a few days and we're already finding just that the ecosystems are so different, even as you travel down the road. And kids, this is something important to know. Normally we are just coming live to you from one national park, but the cool thing about this is you're going to sort of get a lot of Alaska's culture and national parks in this, this one virtual field trip. So good job. Um, <laughs> Getting here from Hawaii, tell us a little bit about your schooling. Yeah, so I actually went to school on the other side of the country uh, at the University of Miami. I got a PhD at the University of Miami studying marine biology and fisheries. And uh, it was, I did a lot of my work in Biscayne National Park. I worked out in the Dry Tortugas National Park. So these are, you know, far flung tropical places. And, uh, you know, I said, hey, I've worked in uh, I've, I've worked in these tropical places. I really want to get an experience working up in uh, an Arctic or subarctic, you know, habitat. Something just completely different than anything I'd ever done. And yeah, the Park Service said, hey, look, we need someone who can, you know, who understands these coastal systems, but at the same time has some idea about um, how the freshwater interacts and, and, and that kind of uh, ecological uh, parameters that, that kind of come around. So long story short, I, I ended up saying, okay, I, I do want to come and, and they brought me up here and it, it was really fantastic. So thank you, National Parks. Yeah, right. I, the National Parks are fantastic. <laughs> They're really good about saying, if you know this here and you know that there, then maybe we can make use of it over here because that'll be really good. So I, I, I love, love that. Yeah. And I love that they're taking your expertise and then bringing you to a place where you can use, um, just really use that. Now, we said we're adjacent to the Kenan Fjords National Park. Can you tell us a little bit about when the Kenan became part of the national park system? Yeah, so actually Alaska is really interesting because most of the national parks all came into being in 1980. And so there was a big lands act, it's called the Alaska National Interest Lands Act and uh, we call it Anilka, and it brought in um, most of the parks that we have up here. There's a few that weren't brought in. So Denali was existed before, Glacier Bay existed before, even Katmai existed before, but it added on pieces to those parks as well as created a whole bunch of new parks. And this is one of those newer parks that it created in the process of developing all of, all of those parks, so. Well, what's special about these 11 coastal parks, if you will. What sort of ties them together? Oh man, there's, uh, so there's, so I, yeah, there's 11 coastal parks and the, the parks exist both in the Pacific Ocean as well as up in the Arctic Ocean. And so you'd think those are really, really different, but there are common challenges that 
we have to think about and, and address. And some of them are things like marine debris that comes up that sort of affects all of our coastal parks and not even just here in Alaska, but you know, more broadly. Um, but also there are uh, areas or regions within Alaska that have a lot of similarities, whether you're talking about you know, glaciers and the creation of fjords, or whether you're talking about these amazing land processes where, uh, where you're just getting beaches that change formation and change shape and, and really create uh, a, a dramatic landscape change that, that affects all of the animals that are living there. It's th so all those things happen up here. The biggest thing that I can say that ties them all together is they all function naturally. They work the way that nature originally created them to do. Well, there are so many things now I want to talk to you about just in that few <laughs> sentences you gave me. But one, you mentioned animals, right? Yeah. So what animals would we find here in Alaska that we may not find in the dry tortugas or? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's a, that's a great question. So up here in Alaska, we have some really fun, like, you know, big charismatic things like uh, killer whales or humpback whales, and you're just not gonna find those down in uh, the dry tortugas. But there's also a lot of really neat things like uh, we have bald eagles that will be flying all over. We have salmon that go running up and down our, well, yeah, go both ways, up and down our streams. We have mountain goats that'll frequently be running around. And of course, there's bears, bears and wolves and those kinds of things. And those are the really big things that everyone thinks about. We have fantastic bird colonies that are out all over in our parks. We also have some of the little things that are underwater that no one really thinks about until you actually get underwater. So there's kelp forests that are along. We, we find these really cool like, so I'm gonna tell you this and I'm gonna, you gotta look it up. I um, will. Hooded nudibranchs are one of the coolest things that we find up here. And they're these little sea slugs that cruise around but they look like the heads of a Venus flytrap. They're just amazing animals that you can see up here all over if you spend enough time and, and look around and, and find them. So the biodiversity here is, is diverse, right? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not a coral reef. There's not as, as much diversity as you see on a coral reef like in one tiny little area, um, but it's very diverse here, yes. Yeah. So let's talk about these studio audience friends that we have here. <laughs> and you know, I was feeling pretty proud of myself saying, oh man, look at all the seagulls. And I saw those in Finding Nemo and you very quickly, but kindly corrected me. <laughs> so what are these if they're not seagulls? So they are gulls for sure. Um, and these are kitty wakes. So kitty wakes, kitty wakes. Yeah. Like kitty cat, kitty wakes. Um, but they, there's many different kinds of gulls. And there are many that you can find all throughout our national parks. And our studio audience happens to be mostly kittiwakes. So, nice. Yeah. Now, are kittiwakes just here, just native to here? Or can we find kittiwakes in other places around the country and world? You can find kittiwakes pretty broadly, um, pretty broadly around. Uh, they, there's actually different kinds of kittiwakes. So you have red-legged kittiwakes. And you can see these ones have little black legs. So they're black-legged kittiwakes. Um, but they, they're, they're, they're fairly well distributed um, around, at least in Western North America, yeah. Right. Well, something new. Remember kids, never stop learning because I've learned something new already. And then the hooded. Oh, the hooded nudibranchs, yeah. <sighs> look that up. I'm gonna give you a little <laughs> research on the bottom of the screen, but look that up too. Well, one thing that you spoke about really sort of touched me as we think about the United Nations sustainability goals and what we want our world, especially our students to start looking towards to try to solve these 17 goals, you know, before the year 2030, we need to hurry, it's 2021, right? Yeah. But one of the things you talked about was the coastal parks and the debris that sometimes is found in water. So UN goal 14 is life below water. And as you think about that, we're talking about the hooded nudibranchs, nudibranchs and the kelp and all the fish under there. But we're also talking about this man-made problem that's happening with all of the debris. So we know that in the 11 coastal parks, there's a lot of stuff being done right, to, to stop that. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that might be happening um, maybe at Wrangell St. Elias where you did some work um, with some students? Oh, sure, and, and we actually do some of these things all over. Um, 
but br broadly speaking, we've, we've gone out um, on different occasions and find different segments of beach. So when we think about marine debris, there's kind of two different kinds of marine debris. There's like real big marine debris that, you know, you walk along and you see all over. And then there's small debris um, that would be microplastics. And so in, in the Wrangles, um, we, we were able to go out and kind of get two separate uh, expeditions where we went out and actually just got students together and they cleaned and cleaned um, several miles of beach. Mm -hmm. And then we were able to, because these are really remote places, it becomes really logistically challenging. So we have to figure out how do you get all this debris that you've picked up out to you know a landfill or wherever it needs to go to be either recycled or disposed of appropriately, not on our beaches. And so this became a very complicated process where the students cleaned them up, but then we actually had to airlift them onto barges and, and move them out from there. So it was a very complicated process. And we did that all through the Gulf with many, many partners. So why is that important to clean it up? To me, it seems just thinking, you know, that would be almost a, a tireless, <laughs> thankless job because the more you clean, the more others come in. So sure. what was the purpose of this a special thing at Wrangell, for example? Yeah, so, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times there is that sort of idea that we go out, we clean up, and then it just comes back. So what's the point of cleaning up? And, and there's actually several reasons to, to do the cleanup. The first of all is there's, there's immediate impacts to the wildlife that might come on. And, and we think about things like entanglement. So you might have a net or something and a bird will come down and get stuck in it or mm -hmm. another animal um, might get stuck in it. You have um, like swallowing plastics will take up room. Your body can't digest it. Well, an animal's body can't digest it either. And so it gets stuck in their stomachs and they slowly begin to starve. So there's that kind of thing. And, and there's pictures all over of, of things like that. So that's kind of the immediate thing. But also think about this, parks are made for people to appreciate and enjoy. And so if you show up, and these are wilderness areas, you show up in an area that's a wilderness area and you, first thing you do, you get off the boat or you get out of the plane and you've just landed and you step out and you see a bunch of trash there, it really impacts the way that you are going to appreciate and the way that you're gonna feel about this amazing area that you've just come into. So that's kind of a secondary thing. And the third thing is we actually can make a difference when we are picking up these um, pieces of trash and debris and that. Uh, there's, we, we can literally go back and look and we've done some studies where there are areas, yeah, where it comes back, but you're, you're actually making progress in cleaning it and, and it doesn't come back as fast as you think it might in many areas. And so we can address the problem and we can make headway against it. And absolutely, and I love that you played along with my devil's advocate piece <laughs> there. You also inspired a new generation to care about the world around them. And we know that when we really, really engage our kids into wanting to care about the world, and they do because they see a future that sometimes may not look very good for them and, and their children and grandchildren. So you're bringing these kids in, for example, at this one place and letting them just take an investment in the world around them. So obviously we want to do that everywhere. Um, we talk a little bit about what we do in one place and how that can be replicated in other places. So you see this particular piece at Wrangell and there were other places now being replicated in other areas in Alaska um, for cleaning up beaches and, and, and waterways? Yeah, so we, so like in Kenai Fjords, um, there are, there's a partner group that works with us that goes out um, regularly uh, each year to go out and clean up different beaches. We have areas out in some of our other parks like Katmai, um, where we have partners that maybe not as regularly, but definitely do go out and have done a fantastic job of doing cleanups, especially in, in some of the most highly visited areas. They've been able to get out and do that a lot. Um, but we also have, even in some of our really remote like Arctic areas, 
we've had uh, efforts that have gone out to, to help clean up and we've worked with communities to try and uh, work with them to get out and, and do some of the cleanups as well. And it's been really fantastic. And, and it, it just, it does give a sense of, we've accomplished something that, that, that these things have been able to be cleaned up and done. And we know that microplastics is just this huge problem all around the world. And when kids, or let's say adults, you know, think, okay, we'll pick up the trash, but there's so many more implications for these microplastics. You think about what it does to wildlife, but then what it will do to us. I mean, the fish eat this, right? And then that can make its way to tables. So there, there are personal um, benefits to helping clean this up because it could get into our foods. Do you find that here or have you found any studies that? So, so that's been really a, a, big, a big concern. Um, so one of the things that makes these national parks and, and actually part of when I go all the way back to talking about 1980 when these uh, parks were created, they were created with people in mind. Like people lived on these, like 1980s, not that long ago. And people were living here, they were existing here. They were existing here for centuries before that. And the lifestyle here is a subsistence lifestyle. And, and it really means that we need to be able to use the food that's provided from the natural world right here in this area. It, it's, if you go into some of these remote communities, you'll see that you know, a gallon of milk might be $8 or something like that. And, you know, and they're just really high prices. It's, it's not feasible. And so, yes, there's a lot of concern, not only about the plastics per se, um, getting in and into the animal, because mostly you eat the meat of the right. animal. You're not going to eat the, the stomach with all the plastics in it. But the bigger concern that's come up, especially with subsistence foods, is um, when those plastics break apart, they have a whole bunch of surface area that's on top of them. And plastics are really good at absorbing toxins from the environment. And so when you break down a whole bunch of these little small um, pieces of plastic, they have a whole lot of surface area and they can bring a lot of toxins with them. Mm. So there's been a little bit of concern about, well, are those toxins making it into the actual meat that would be passed on to people? And so it's not the plastic but more so the toxin that's coming along with that. And, and that's where the concern really is. And I know there's definitely been research into that particular aspect. And I'm gonna leave it at that. There's scientists that study that way more than I do, so. Right, and, and I love that. We wanna be transparent. When we visit parks, we, we come to the experts. Like we wanna know what you know here. And I love that you're saying there's more to know, right? So we'll do some research on that. So it's, it's much more than just picking up a piece of plastic off the beach. However, that's where it starts. Which leads me to our STEM challenge. So Taze, what we do is we invite students around the world to um, research the national park, wherever we are, and then we issue a challenge to them. So I think we're gonna go with goal 14 and life underwater. So kids, here is your challenge. We want you to do some research about the areas that you live in, especially the waterways, the lakes, the rivers, the oceans, and find out what kind of problem those places are experiencing with trash, just on the beaches. Um, if you're living in Florida, the Gulf Coast or the East Coast, whether you're living in a landlocked area that has rivers and lakes, find out what they most are challenged with in the areas of trash and water. And then your challenge is to come up with a way to get rid of it, to take care of it. So it could be something as easy as organizing a trash pickup day with your family and maybe inviting friends with you. It could be something more complicated, like coming up with a device that scientists and oceanographers can use to take out into the water and clean up those really small pieces of plastic that you can't see. So it, it can be a social event. It can be something really detailed in engineering. Whatever you do, we want you to do some research. We want you to design, use the engineering design process come up with ideas, brainstorm. Remember, two minds are better than one sometimes. Um, build a prototype, and then we're gonna share it with Taze here in Alaska so he can sort of see what kids are thinking about all over the world. 
and maybe some of your ideas can be used here to help them with trash and debris on the beaches. We know already that we've had several of your ideas that are now being used by national parks. We have the um, endemic newt and invasive crayfish traps that are being used at Crater Lake. We have the um, green crab species ideas that are being used in Acadia. So here is our next big thing. We want kids because I feel like kids are sometimes smarter than we are. Absolutely. I'm locked in my ways. I got my ideas already here and fresh ideas are absolutely the way to grow and develop. That's how we get new things. Absolutely. And so. what you said is so important. As adults, we sometimes are, we have our, like you said, our ideas, but we know what's failed and we don't want to try that again. Kids, you just think out of the box all the time. So we want you to come up with your ideas. I do want Taze to share another thing with you. He was sharing earlier about his kids and how they talk about the national parks. And on his arm, <laughs> he has a patch. So yeah, show, show the patch and tell us what does that mean? Yeah, so the patch is a really interesting piece. So my kids, they asked about, uh, why do I have an upside down tree? It looks like it's been eaten by beetles and is dead. And I had to, you know, laugh and talk with them a little bit about it. And the long story short is that it's not actually an upside down dead tree with brown leaves. It's actually an arrowhead. And the arrowhead has a lot of symbolism that goes with it because it talks about um, it represents uh, the historical and cultural aspects of what the parks are really about. And not, um, it's not all about just the natural world, but also there's history and culture and, and things that came, people that came, uh, situations that came before us. And, and these parks conserve not only the natural world, but also the cultural and historical world for us as well as for future generations. What a great story. So, I mean, really, that, that is the national parks. That's, yeah. that's what they're here for. Um, there's kids out there watching. There's going to be a lot watching you, I promise. But how can they become a national park ranger or staff person? Can you give them some advice now while they're in school, some things they can start doing to, to prepare their paths? Tell yeah, them. Yeah, so... If you want to become a part of the National Park Service, there's all kinds of opportunities that we have, whether it's, you know, volunteering. I talked a little bit about volunteering and getting out and just, you know, getting to know your parks, getting to, to work in the parks and understand. It's how I got to do it. You know, I, I was with my schooling and I did work in the parks and that was a fantastic introduction to the parks. But there's also many opportunities that include, um, Things like internships that we do. The park has several different internships in uh, a handful of different places. And you can look those up. You can find them. But you can also just go to the parks and say, hey, I really want to work with the park. How can I do that? How can I help? And the parks, I guarantee you, will be happy to figure out a way that you can do something to be a part of what they do. And that can lead you down the pathway to becoming a part of the National Park Service. So I would also encourage you to read lots. Check out all of the YouTube videos you can find on Nat Park Expedition Challenge and just talk to people. Like learn how to talk to people and share what you know. Taze, thank you so much for allowing us to be here. I know we're going to spend more time here and we're going to talk to more people, but excellent Boom. job. Still during COVID, so we're still right. elbowing. So thanks so much for having us here. Did Absolutely. you notice how nice our kitty Kitty, kitty wakes. Kitty wakes yeah. were. They got really <laughs> quiet and I thought that was kind of cool because when we came out they were just really. They were squawking. Maybe it's nap time. <laughs> well maybe. kids, thank you so much for joining us today in Seward, Alaska adjacent to the Kenan Fjords National Park. This is Dr. Drizzle out. <laughs>